We have to move now. <laughs> All right, good evening, everyone. My name is Catherine Bandy. I am one of the associates of the Western Maryland Room. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. I know there was a little confusion about the time. Uh, there was the wrong time posted in the newspaper, but thank you for, for networking and reaching out to each other and helping us spread the word about the correct time for tonight's program. We appreciate that very much. Um, as you've noticed, the library hours have also changed, and we are here an hour earlier than we would traditionally be with our evening program. So thank you again for making the extra effort to join us this evening and welcome um, Dr. Jason Williams, who will be our speaker. Jason Williams, MD, grew up in California and Montana, but now calls Virginia's Shenandoah Valley home. He is a board-certified psychiatrist who trained at Johns Hopkins Hospital and has subspecialty training in psychosomatic medicine. He is also a proud father of three young adults. As an intrepid, independent scholar of largely forgotten history, Dr. Williams staunchly believes studying the past can lead to personal development and growth, which empowers our collective future. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Williams. Thank you. The last time I did an in-person little lecture or talk like this was in Paris, France, about a year ago. Two people showed up. <laughs> <laughs> Way to go, Hagerstown. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're a big city. Not only that, they couldn't get the PowerPoint to work, and the two people who showed up, they didn't spoke French. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone here speak English? <laughs> Any Freemasons here? Oh, I better watch out. I better be really careful. So, a couple Freemasons, so they probably know more than I do about some of this. And um, the, top of the topic is the George Washington Masonic Cave. And I kind of threw in a little bonus at the end about a little tie-in to your town, Hagerstown. The title of the book comes from a quote from George Washington himself, who was a Freemason. George Washington is normally thought of a, how much time do we have here, by the way, Catherine, so I don't, I, I can go on and on. <laughs> we can go on and on for 90 minutes. 90 minutes, okay. <laughs> so George Washington is usually remembered as a man of action, not words. There have been Americans who've been much more remembered for famous quotes, Abraham Lincoln, or Thomas Jefferson, or Alexander Hamilton, or people like that. George Washington was the guy who like did. Truth will ultimately prevail where pains is taken. The grammar is a little shaky. Washington was not the best speller. His grammar was not always perfect, right? Cut him some slack. Truth will ultimately prevail where pains is taken to bring it to light. I love that quote. It's actually brought to light. It's a Masonic pity. It means being made a Freemason. I'm not a Freemason, by the way. But there's a lot of truth to this statement. You've got to work for it. And this book was a labor of love. It had a lot to do with researching the cave, the history, piecing it all together, trying to figure out what's truth and what's not. So I've always been sort of a George Washington buff. I know quite a bit about it. George Washington, Mount Vernon. I used to live in Alexandria. Um, but I had never heard of the George Washington Masonic Cave in any history books. And I was like, huh, is this like the, the myth of the cherry tree that George chopped down? Is that what this is? Right. I heard about it from a buddy of mine, one of my best friends. You'll see a photo of him here in a second. He lives in Charlestown, West Virginia. You guys know where that is? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, and he said, hey, Jason. He's a therapist, I'm a psychiatrist. He said, Jason, what do you know about the George Washington Masonic Cave? I said, well, I don't 
said, I don't know anything about that. She said, well, there's this local rumor up here in Charlestown that George Washington was associated with this cave. He said, I've never been in. I don't know anyone who's never been in. But that's the myth, the legend. Um, <clears throat> the story goes that when a very precocious and adventure-seeking 16-year-old George Washington was living in Mount Vernon, in his older half-brother's home called Mount Vernon, that on this trip to the Virginia frontier when he was only 16 years old in 1748, he was a surveyor in training. Right, we know this for a fact, that's not myth, right? And he went with his best friend, George William Fairfax, who was about eight years older, and lived right next door to Mount Vernon, next plantation over, called Belmore, which is the home of the Fairfax family, Lord Fairfax. Lord Fairfax's nephew was William Fairfax, and his son was George Fairfax. So two Georges head off over the Blue Ridge Mountains into the Shenandoah Valley into today's West Virginia. Back then it was still the colony of Virginia, right? And they entered this cave. And the legend says that the first president of our country carved his name, his signature, and the year on the back wall, and then left. And the legend further states that in 1754, Washington returned and founded the first Masonic Lodge. Freemasonry is a fraternal organization, right? Don't think Illuminati there, right? West of the Blue Ridge Mountains. Couple images. There are going to be a lot of images in here. On the left, we have a survey. I need a third hand. Done by George Washington. Can you see the red dot? Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is done in 1747 slash eight. We'll get to that in a second. This is a plan of Major Lawrence Washington's turnip field, as surveyed by me. GW. It's a very simple survey, four-sided, right? With a nice compass rose around it, you know, some nice handwriting, etc. One of his early surveys of his brother, it's not like a real survey, right? He's young, he needs some experience. He's out on his brother's farm. This is where their turnips grow, right? That's actually George Washington's compass. And those are his chains that he used to mark off territory. This is the cabin that George Washington is said to have used when he was out on the frontier. You want to guess what the little hole is in the side of the wall? So. Shooting quarters. Yes. Indigenous people, as some people call them. The Native Americans that I know back west in Montana, they like to be called Indian. American Indians. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to offend anybody. And if I use any words, I kind of go back and forth with different lingo. And that's to hopefully address everybody and make everybody feel comfortable. <laughs> Little geography lesson. This should look pretty familiar, right? You're up here in Hagerstown, Martinsburg, 81. We just drove up from around Harrisonburg, where I live. Right? Washington, D.C. over here. Fairfax, Alexandria, down in the right corner here. Very close by to Mount Vernon down here. Charlestown, right here. Harpers Ferry, right there. All looks familiar, right? Potomac River, Shenandoah River. This dotted line is West Virginia. And as you know, all of this is Maryland. This is now West Virginia. This is Virginia. That's Winchester, which used to be called, back in George Washington's time, Fredericktown when he was very young. <clears throat> so the, the, there's these birds. So they went across the mountains, across the river, and actually the White Post is where Lord Fairfax had his estate. So they actually went first to White Post, 
Later, we'll see that they traveled up towards Charlestown. What is today's? So there was no Charlestown, right? More geography. This is an older map, not Google. Okay. Just to kind of give you a lay of the land, Washington, D.C., up here, so obviously it's not that old of a map, right? Number one, Mount Vernon. Up here, X, this marks the, the cave. Mountains, Blue Ridge. River, river, cave. Berkeley County is what it was called before it became Jefferson County. Before that was, for that part was Frederick County, which is still what Winchester is today. Okay. Washington was first a surveyor in Culpeper. He actually was born in Westmoreland County down here. When he was an infant, he and his family moved to Fredericksburg, right? And then eventually, after his father died, it's a, a, he was like 10 or 12, uh, then he moved in with his older half-brother Lawrence up here. Remember, Lawrence served in the British Navy. He was gone a lot. So George Washington frequently spent time next door at the Fairfax. Down here, Williamsburg, the colonial capital of Virginia. Right here, Richmond, today's capital of Virginia. Almost done with the geography at all. So, Jefferson County today is the very tip of the eastern panhandle. You should know what's over here. Pennsylvania up here, Ohio, Kentucky, all this is Virginia. All right, I live around in here. Over here is Jefferson County. What you see is Charlestown is kind of central in the county. A couple other very historic towns, Harbors Ferry, I'm sure you've heard of that. Right? Up here, Shepherdstown. Anybody know what Shepherdstown used to be called? Mecklenburg. Mecklenburg. There are no prizes. Um, and see this right here, that, that big bend in the river? We're going to be talking about that bend. We're going to be talking about this little stream that goes through Charlestown and into the Shenandoah River. It's called Ebbets Run. I think that's about it for geography. Now, Charlestown, at least when I was living in Northern Virginia, was pretty much known for Charlestown races and slots, right? I hear their ads all the time. Come on, Washington, D.C. Come on and, you know, bring your, the, all your taxpayer money that you, own, that you earn and bring it on out here and gamble. Right? I'm a little bit missing. <coughs> so, but Charlestown had some very fascinating history of its own. For starters, that's the courthouse of Jefferson County. That guy should look pretty familiar. John Brown. John Brown. Old John Brown, right? <coughs> yeah. Yeah, he just saw him. So he actually was found guilty of treason for raiding Harper's Ferry in that courthouse and was sentenced to death and hung in Charleston. Which many people say triggered or led to the American Civil War. I think it's still very much debated whether he was a patriot and somebody we should look up to, or a madman, or just a criminal. Very different opinions on it. Over here, anyone know what that building is? It's called Happy Retreat. And the man right here is Charles Washington, a younger brother of George Washington. <coughs> Charlestown is named after him. Okay. That's his home. It's now a historical preservation site. Not quite as nice as Mount Vernon. Now, <clears throat> this photo is from the early 19, mid 1920s, when the George Washington Masonic Cave very briefly was a tourist spot. For the price of a hot dog, you had to buy one, you would get to go into the Masonic Cave, down this wide wooden stairs, go into the back, they put in some plumbing to pump out water, and you could go into the back and see the Masonic Cave's fame signature that we'll be looking at. You don't have to go into the cave, okay? Um, 
So when I, you know, I saw this, I heard little bits and pieces, I couldn't find the signature of Washington and the year, which the legend says is there. Couldn't find a signature, so I'm like, Scott, we gotta go in and take a picture. Let's see if it's still even around. Is it gone? Right, it's a limestone cave, limestone erodes. Maybe it's gone. Sometimes caves collapse in. Who knows? I said, we gotta go in. So we did. This is actually the morning. We went to the cave for the first time. That's my buddy Scott, and that's me. Parked at a little park nearby. There's no parking or anything. It's on private property. You have to, it's a very small piece of property. You have to walk over. Down on the other side of that fence, it's called Old Cave Road. And from up here, you can't even see there's a cave there. It's this little shallow sink, but otherwise it's flat land. And even here, you kind of see an overhang. You can't really see a cave yet. You're right on top of it. And then as you kind of go down the, there are no more wooden steps, but as you walk down, you see like, what? what's up? You know, all this junk out here. Mm -hmm. Old gates, and doors, <clears throat> old bricks and mortar, and it's just wide open. People have been tearing this off in an old sofa. Almost hard to imagine that George Washington once walked right through there. And inside, <laughs> junk, tires, sofas, drug paraphernalia. <clears throat> yeah, there's uh, there are quite a few large out rock boulders and outcroppings and, <coughs> and uh, flowstone and other formations that could be used for benches and tables and stuff. It's quite you know it's definitely tall enough to walk around in the main compartment. We spent a couple hours. We didn't know where exactly on the wall, right? So we we're looking all over these different side chambers in the big wall, and we couldn't find it. <coughs> Gave up, and then we went back in, looked around. I mean, there are lots of carvings, like up here. Many Freemasons have come back in over the years and centuries and carved their, their initials or their names and their lodge numbers. It can be kind of confusing <coughs> sometimes. You don't know if 89 is 1789, 1889, or 1989, right? Um, you'll see dates as recent as 2012, but then some 1926, and this is 1897, so all kinds of years, all kinds of mechanisms, pencils, paint, all kinds of stuff. There's some interesting etchings, like this is the skull and crossbones here. I don't even know what that is. Some red paint that covered some parts of the walls that did look like graffiti. <coughs> That's my buddy Scott heading down one of the <clears throat> passageways. In fact, it's this one right here. The water got up about that high. This is where you enter, go down. The big room is right here. You go further down, and George Washington's signature is right here. Now, notice somebody came by in 1978 and did a survey of it, right? So it's not like this cave was an unknown, right? But no one had really collected all of the data and information and assembled it and go beyond that and try to make sense of it. So we went down this passageway with cold water, definitely, but very clear. It had been raining a couple days before. And we finally found it. I don't know how clear this is going to be. That's the G and the W in one distinctive kind of font. A S H I N G. It kind of curves around the wall, so you can't get it all clearly in one photograph. Maybe one of the reasons why not many people photographed it. Here's the rest S H I N G P O N. Can you see that? 1748. Scott and I were ecstatic when we found it. We thought, oh, we've 
We're like Indiana Jones, right? <laughs> we got a picture of it. This is like the UFO picture we've been waiting for, right? It turned out that back in 1966, this very famous early American caver, not early, but 19th century caver, had the same idea. And in his edition of, first edition of Depths of the Earth, a very, um, you know, it's not a print, but it's a known book, <laughs> um, has a picture, but it's not as complete. He, his picture kind of has this and leaves off the year at the very end of it. So we got the first complete picture. Mm. Um, this is just my hand version of what it really looks like. Okay. Now, should have mentioned back on the last slide, if you see my fingers, it kind of gives you a perspective for the size. It's not like a giant mural size etching, right? I should just leave this out of my pocket. Um, George Washington. <coughs> When he was, I think he was 12 or 13, or maybe, I think he was 14. So a couple years before he went out on the frontier, um, wanted to join the British Navy like his brother. And he actually got a commission to do so. And his mother, Mary Ball Washington, was petrified. She had heard stories about how dangerous it is to be on the seas in a ship back then. And she pleaded with young George Washington, don't go. And George finally caved in, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and for his agreeing to stay home and continue his studies in mathematics and survey, she gave him this little three inch pocket knife with a mother of pearl handle. And George Washington kept that pocket knife in his pocket for the rest of his life, when he was 14. Two years before he was 16, he put that pocket in his knife, in his knife in his pocket. Perhaps there's a connection, or I don't know. Now, in the winter of 1777 and 1778, the Valley Forge, the brutal winter that the American soldiers had to endure, Things were looking very bleak at that point in the Revolutionary War. General Washington, apparently, according to one source, wrote his letter of resignation and was about to submit it to the Congress back in Philadelphia, the nation's capital. And one of his closest confidants, General Knox, sat down with him in front of a fire in the winter and said, George, you cannot do that because remember, I, I left out a part. When, when George's mom, when President Washington's mom gave him that knife, she instructed him, always obey your superiors. And General Knox told George Washington, Congress has not told you to surrender. You cannot do that. You have to follow your mom's instructions. They tore up his letter of resignation and threw it in the fire. Could be another legend, except that legend comes down to us from General Knox. Fort Knox, that guy, right? <laughs> so it might be true. Now, what I wonder is whether or not, see, I'm just a psychiatrist, right? This is not exactly my line of work. What I wonder is, I wonder if you're like in the screw holes or somewhere stuck in the blade, if there are little remnants of limestone. <laughs> this knife was inherited by one of Washington's nephews, eventually donated to Lodge Number 22 in Alexandria, Virginia, and is in their museum. I've encouraged them to do some inspections of this knife. You know, it's fallen on deaf ears, that's all I can say. So far. Here's another myth for you. Anybody know where that is? Natural bridge. Natural bridge, right? Further, is it up or down in the in the valley? Okay. Down. 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 I hear up. up and I hear down. Upstream. Upstream. So it's further up, right? South is up. So if anybody asks 
Where are you in relation to the Shenandoah Valley? If you're not in it here, but I don't think the Hagerstown is in the valley, but you're towards the lower part of the valley. So anyway, up in the higher part of the valley, you have this natural bridge, and right about up here, about 20, 25 feet up, there's this GW carved into the side. Somebody even made it easier to spot by putting this. There's even a plaque that says that around 1750, George Washington, while surveying natural bridge, carved his initials under the bridge's arch. His initials can still be seen today, directly across blah, 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 23 feet up. Now, the tourist guides, I've been there like three times now, right? The tourist guides will point to it and say, look, George Washington's signature, and look at that plaque. But if you go back to the original person who found it and what they wrote now, it was found in the early 1900s. This came about much later. And there was they, what they found is some surveying rocks at the bottom here along where this path is that had some carvings, didn't say GW, had some surveyor markings on it. And somebody said, oh, was George, let's associate George Washington with it, right? There's absolutely no proof or historical evidence anywhere that George Washington went near this place. It was purchased by Thomas Jefferson, right? But George never said, I've been down a natural bridge. There's nothing that says that. And certainly that is not George. Here's another George Washington. This one is inside a cave. This one looks different. It's almost cursive. It's a lot bigger than the carving. This is in what's called the Madison Saltpeter Cave. Anybody know where Grand Caverns is? It's in Grottoes, Virginia. Good name for a town. The reason they call it Grottoes is they have like three or four caves all in this one hillside. Right. The Shenandoah Valley has lots of caves. We drove by, I think, three or four of them as we drove up here today. Um, for a long time, Grand Caverns was sort of, Luray Caverns, I'm sure you've heard of, right? Anyone here been to Luray Caverns? Yeah, a couple? Yeah, quite a few. That's, today, that's the main show cave around the Washington, D.C. area. Grand Caverns used to be, this is at a much smaller cave right next to Grand Caverns called the Madison Cave. It's not named after the Madison you think it was named after, by the way. But this guy, TJ, Thomas Jefferson, did the first survey of that cave with that George Washington signature. It's the first American cave map. It was done by, wouldn't you have loved to live back then? It's it like a blank canvas. I'm going to be the president, and I'm going to also be the first caver, the first spelunker or caver to actually, you know, draw out a cave. Right. So he drew that. He never mentioned anything about a George Washington signature in that cave. Of course, caves are very dark. Maybe he missed it. But the first historical mention of that signature wasn't until after the Civil War in about the 1880s, I think it was. So there's no, no record of any connection of George Washington or a signature there till then. So I think this is a forgery, maybe a copycat. Um, just, just for reference, so Natural Bridge is here. Grand Caverns is right here. This cave is right next to Grand Caverns. We passed by Endless, Luray Skyline, and Shenandoah. I didn't see Crystal. I don't know where that is. I haven't seen that one. Um, at least there's no sign from the 81. Um, and just for, you know, you're up here, again, this is West Virginia, Maryland up here. Um, the uh, cave is right about there. George Washington is not a cave, right? And just for grottos is around in here, where, where the Grand Caverns in this cave are, is down here. No proof George Washington went that far south in the Shenandoah Valley. Certainly no proof he went down to Natural Bridge, which is south of Lexington, around in here. Lots of proof that he went to where George Washington Sonic Cave is located. And one of the first things I did when I left the cave was like, I want to compare the signature to George Washington's, you know, 
is it, could it possibly be? Like, I'm no handwriting expert, but let's take a look. And I talked to some historians and say, they said, no, it can't be. George Washington wrote in this very regal, distinguished, flowing, beautiful handwriting. You know, he wouldn't do that. Well, thing is, first of all, there's only 16. His handwriting changed a lot throughout his lifetime. And not only that, carving your name on a limestone wall may not be quite the same as taking out a piece of parchment. Um, the font here is called, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, Caswell. And this was a very popular font up until about the 1780s or 90s, and then it fell out of vapor. Okay. And George Washington loved this font. He used it a lot on like this compass rose that he made two years later. And this is these are out of his letter book. Like uh, he would make copies of all these letters, but he would do them alphabetically. So this is like the G's, or everybody named G goes under this, and everybody named W. You can see that at least you know these kind of look like well, yeah, they kind of look like they're not wrong. It's not proof that he did it, but they're not wrong. We also see that the other font on the cave, that's the I in Washington, that's the T, show kind of this loop down on both, right? And he didn't always write in cursive like some people claim. On a lot of his maps and early surveys, he didn't. And sometimes they loop. So again, it's not wrong. Notice how impeccable his handwriting was back then. It's almost like it's printed out, but that's a teenager writing back then. But there were a lot of people that wrote like that back then. What a lot of people didn't do is this. Combined fonts. A plan of my farm on the... Hmm, very interesting. Big A, one font, the rest in a different font. George Washington was a clever guy, very careful guy. You wouldn't expect your average bookster going into a cave to, you know, scrawl a signature to think that much. Uh, let alone put it in the very back of the cave where no one's going to be able to find it and see it. If I was a hoopster, if I wanted to make money off of a George Washington signature, I'd put it right in the front and say, hey, come on in. It's really hard to get where that is, actually. This is a much later map that George Washington did in the last years of his life. This mansion house. Loves certain fonts. Combined is a very, it's done by hand, right? <clears throat> Fortunately, George Washington also kept a journal of his travels as a 16-year-old. Now here he, he labels it, this is the cover right here, a little clasp, and it says, Journey Over the Mountain, 1747. Right. And this is a sample page from March the 16th. And this whole thing about the year, so there's your Gregorian year and the Julian year, and they had recently switched over, and people were kind of in the habit of putting both on their dates. But sometimes they wouldn't. And inside this journal, here he put both, but in many of his journal entries, he would only put one, like it's inside the cave. So I'm not so sure that we can say just because the cave has one digit instead of two, that it couldn't be him because he did that himself. He wasn't consistent with double dating, is what they call it. Um, and this this book, his journal, is filled with practice surveys. These were not real surveys. They were never filed with the survey office, and they were all done for his buddy George uh, Fairfax. And in his journal, he also described encounters with American Indians and the wildlife and early settlers. On the day of March 16, he's within seven miles of the cave. We, can, we know that from who he spent the night with. And the entry is suspiciously vague. There are no surveys in his journal from that day. All he wrote is, we set out early and finished about one o'clock, and then traveled up to Fredericktown, today's from Chester, where a baggage came to us. We cleaned ourselves and took a review of the town. 
This was like a little side trip that Washington and Fairfax took. They were actually headed further west, and they took this little side trip to Charlestown. And we don't know what he did. He doesn't say, oh, I crawled in a cave and carved my signature. We'll never find CCTV footage that says he did. But he was in the vicinity in, in this year, per his own journal. And he was definitely within a horseback's right away. So the timing kind of makes sense. What's interesting is his journal, well, that actually, <laughs> In 1836, this book right here, History of the Virginia Valley, came out, the second edition of it. And it was the first historical mention of the George Washington carved signature. It's a brief blur, and it tells us tradition informs us. So it sounds like in 1836, there was already this legend of George Washington's signature. The author also said there were probably Masonic enigmas carved on rocks outside of the cave, and the author was a Freemason, by the way. He couldn't quite decipher them. The second oldest date inside the cave that we could find was 1801. I'm going to show you evidence in a little bit that in 1781, there were some admiring visitors to the cave towards the tail end of the American Revolutionary War. But in 1843 and 1844, 20 years, almost 20 years before the Civil War started, the Freemasons published, I found some old articles talking about the Masonic cave in some old, long-forgotten Masonic journals. In 1864, during the Civil War, somebody came by and made a sketch of the cave. We'll take a look at that. But George Washington's journal from when he was 16 wasn't first published until 1889. After Washington died, his papers, and he was meticulous notekeeper and kept everything, they got scattered. A lot of his papers got sold off and people were snipping them out and they had to be reassembled and it took quite a bit of time for them to be published. And that first edition only had 750 copies. It wasn't until the 1920s that his teenage journal was widely published, long after when in 1836, it was already a tradition. So if somebody did go into the cave, let's say in the late 1700s or even earlier, and did this signature, it was either Washington or somebody who knew Washington's whereabouts in that year. A brother, best friend, somebody who knew he was there. Don't know if it was George Washington who did that signature, but whoever put it in and when they put it in, they knew his whereabouts. This is the uh, cave sketch, Washington's Masonic Cave on the Selden Plantation. Remember that name, Selden, here. This is during the Civil War. This is General Sherman, right? Sheridan. Sheridan. And this was done by an illustrator who was embedded in the Union Army and was taking sketches of various things as Sheridan marched through the Shenandoah Valley to try to attack the Confederacy so they wouldn't attack Washington, D.C. is basically what they were doing. And they stopped over outside Charlestown and <clears throat> they wanted to hear about this George Washington's cave again. 1864. And when they showed up, the illustrator went to Farmer Selden and said, hey, I want to see this George Washington's cave. Can you give me a light and give me a tour to go inside? And Farmer Selden said, I can't. My farm is being raided by you Yankees. They were taking away his hogs and you know, pillaging his, his granary. And he said, I don't have time for this. This is in that book with that illustration. He describes it, the illustrator. But, and he says, but he, Farmer Selden gave me a light, and he said, you can go in, and then a soldier volunteered to lead the way. There were a couple soldiers. <coughs> Farmer Selden didn't go in. He was too busy trying to protect his farm. Here we have a second, so the soldier's dilemma. All of the dying, with the exception of his feet, I don't know if you can see his feet right there, disappeared from sight, which was acclaimed by an alarmed yell, and a, for God's sake, call me back. 
as he was hanging over a precipice. And we could hear the sound of rushing water in the blackness. We seized his legs and finally succeeded in landing him. All hands crawfished backward out of the rock ribbed passage. They were unable to see the Washington signature. It was too far back. They didn't make it. But at least they tried. And they made, the, the illustrator made that image. Big one on the left. You can see, I don't know if you can see it. Let me point out a couple things here. So there's a guy standing right at the entrance with holding up a light, a candle or some sort. And he's walking through the same stones that we saw earlier are there this is during the Civil War. There is no road over here. There was no old cave road yet. Right? But you can see somebody was living over there on the other side. Keep that in mind too. Now, interestingly, the year before Washington and George Fairfax went out to where the cave is, the X, I feel like the mic just gave up. Oh, dear. Low battery. Oh, my. Okay. <clears throat> I'll try to speak up. Don't want to waste time here. Um, that's where the cave is. That's that big loop. This is the river, Shenandoah River. This is a big bend. They call it the horseshoe-shaped horseshoe, horseshoe bend in the, in the uh, Shenandoah River. And George Fairfax's family already owned this land on this side. But the year before, they trekked out to the wilderness. Well, it wasn't really wilderness. There were some people living there. But they, they trekked out there. The year before, George Fairfax had been granted this piece of property on the opposite side of the river. Somebody had gone out and sur surveyed it for him, filed it. My theory is George Fairfax, on this little detour, said, you know what? I want to go check out my, my new plot of land. And that's why they came out here. It's about a mile from there to the Cape. Now, on this piece of property, there was already a home right here where number one is. Somebody was, in, there's a, a, a home there, we'll see in a second. And on this piece of property over here along the river, this is Ebbets Stream or Ebbets Run that runs through, goes right by the cave and it empties into the Shenandoah River. But right here where number two is, there is what's called a bloomery. It was an early type of iron forge, ideal for the frontier, where you couldn't really bring in a big modern, back then modern, uh, uh, forge. And it used Ebbets Run, which is right here. It's a very small stream. You could almost hop across it, but then you'd be like, nah, maybe not. Right? So it's not a big river, it's a little stream. And it powered this forge right here where it intersected with the Shenandoah River. That's just what a bloomery would look like. A bloom was the actual piece of iron that would be heated up and then taken out and then it would be hammered to get all the uh, oxides out of it, right? So it wasn't as pure as other iron, but it was good enough for horseshoes and things like that. So, kind of some reasons to come out here. Not only was he in the area, some reasons, right? George Washington's best friend had just picked up this piece of property. We know from a very early on George Fairfax and later George Washington, when he was a little older, became very interested in iron forges out here on the frontier. Um, and there was somebody already living here. It's not inconceivable. In fact, I'm not going to say it's not inconceivable. A 16-year-old teenager who's adventure-seeking comes out here, and he hears there's a cave over here. Of course, he's going to go in. <laughs> this is the Hermitage. It's actually the oldest standing building in all of West Virginia, right there, 18, uh, 1740. And this is Vestal's Bloomery, which was right here now. This is, Vessel's Bloomery was in production from 1742 till the Civil War. This is not 1742, right? Those are ruins from right around the time of the Civil War. Um, but that's where it was, right along the Shenandoah River, right behind it. Now, this is 
Lord Fairfax, that's George William Fairfax. A couple years later, in 1750, George Washington actually surveyed the land immediately surrounding the cave, which was like all of, this was sort of like the boundaries of what George Fairfax already had. Over here is the property that the, that, uh, that home was on. But all the property in between it, George Washington was the one, we have a mic back? Awesome. He surveyed all of that for the Fairfaxes, and he also carved up in survey form, not literally, the land right here where the cave is. He actually surveyed these properties for the Fairfaxes. It was part of Lord Thomas Fairfax's Northern Neck Proprietary. 5.2 million acres in it, inherited. The cave farm came to be this piece of land right next to the cave, or even the cave kind of crosses over into the cave farm. The cave farm is named after the cave, right? And centered on this piece of property right here that attached to this, sort of like all of this, which attached to that first property, Fairfax, George Fairfax already owned. And we know that the Fairfaxes were involved in Freemasonry back in England since the 1705. I, there's no proof of it, but I suspect the Fairfaxes had a lot to do after George Washington lost his older half-brother Lawrence and then and earlier his father. You know, I think that the Fairfaxes became a surrogate family. They were all Freemasons. And I suspect that they heavily influenced George into becoming a Freemason. And Lord Fairfax is the one who hired George Washington to be a surveyor and sent him out here to survey those lands right at the Cape. This is that big bend in the Shenandoah River. This side is what they went to see in 17, I, I suspect they went to see in 1748. This side they already owned. This is the eastern side of the river. This is the western side. Eventually in the 1800s, a spa resort called the Shannon Hill Springs was built here. George Fairfax tried to do things over here but never could. He actually left for England with his wife during or shortly before the Revolutionary War, never came back to the United States and died broken uh, financially uh, in England. Um, but uh, I believe they came up here and saw the cave over here, a mile away. Now, also in 1750, George Washington made his first real estate purchases two miles away from the cave, right? And eventually assembled about 2,000 acres and called it Bullskin, long before he inherited Mount Vernon. Right? That was his first homestead. Mainly tobacco at first, later he added other crops like wheat, corn, and he had hogs there. He had 11 enslaved people who were inherited by his, from his father. In his journal, he describes how some of the slaves got smallpox and George Washington personally went to take care of them, found a physician for them, and even told his farm manager, if any of them get sick again, Put them up in my bedroom. Pretty interesting. You don't hear that very much. Um, he also enabled his siblings, his brothers, and, and his sister. He had a sister, and some of his closest friends, including Masonic friends, to invest in land nearby. It wouldn't be until twenty, more than twenty years later, that Charlestown was formed by Charles Washington. And Washington, George Washington, continued to operate his bullskin until his death in 1799. He didn't go there much anymore. He lived at Mount Vernon, but was still making money for him because the soil at Mount Vernon had been depleted. That's why people like George Washington and George Fairfax wanted to go out there and find lands, grow crops better. They could enable their posh lives back in the more developed part of Virginia. He's making money, right? This is what the whole skin looks like today on the left. Nothing. Well, there are actually a few old structures 
Not that over here. We'll get to that in a second. You have to literally cross through Evans Street. Uh, run right here. There's a modern home over here and some rubble. There's not even a roadside marker that says this is where George Washington's first home. There are some signs nearby, but there's nothing at the turn off from the main road that says, no, this is where George Washington first had his home. Amazing. Why? Probably <clears throat> the Civil War had a lot to do with it. Remember this part of Virginia, the Shenandoah Valley, saw a lot of action, destruction. I mean, there are not many colonial historians who even look at this stuff. Everybody in the Shenandoah Valley wants to study Civil War. And this, this gets neglected. Speaking of neglected, this is a drawing from the Civil War itself. This is the Norborn Church where the Washingtons went to worship a couple miles away from that. That Civil War, that's today. Well, a couple years ago when I took the picture. Pretty sad. Again, totally neglected. George Washington's first church, or one of the first churches that he would have in 1752, at age 20, normally Masons have to be how old to become a Freemason? 21. 21. He got in early. Um, joined the Masonic fraternity as an entered apprentice at the Lodge in Fredericksburg on the Rappahannock River. There were only 13 other members of, of his chapter or his lodge then, mostly Scottish immigrants. It was an uncharted lodge. Didn't have any authority from a grand lodge. So George Washington didn't need one. There was no rule back then within Masonic tradition that said you have to have a charter. It wasn't until like a couple decades later that that was required by the Grand Lodge of England. But even then, it's thought that his lodge was maybe founded as a Scottish military lodge. It's interesting that George Washington, a lot of his closest friends and colleagues were Scottish. Um, later, he joined Alexandria's Lodge, and in, when it was instituted in 1788, he was the first worshipful master, more of an honorary title. There have been a lot of people, including Freemasons, who kind of dismissed George Washington's involvement in their fraternity. I actually see kind of two things. Either some people exaggerate Washington's involvement in Freemasonry, like he's like the chosen Freemason and we all look up to him as night. Or there are some who say, nah, he really didn't care about Freemasonry. He wasn't involved for much of his life. Well, this is what Washington wrote. Let's go by his words towards the end of his life. I shall, this is a letter to the Sonic Lodge up north. I shall always be happy to advance the interests of society to be considered by them as a deserving brother. He still thought of himself. The language sounds a little distant, maybe. Like, I kind of, I still consider myself a Freemason, and I honored them, but it doesn't sound like I'm in the lodge every, every, you know, at every meeting. It's kind of my take on it. This is where that pen knife is inside. This is the George Washington Masonic Temple in Alexandria. They still have lodge meetings. It was built in the 1920s, but they have a museum in there with lots of Masonic artifacts from Washington's life. There are actually two different lodges that use this building. Wonderful place, museum. Even if you're not a Freemason, you want to see a really interesting museum, go there. This is George Washington later in his life wearing a past master's medal, not medal, but uh, emblem around his neck. It said that Washington didn't want this portrait. This is a pastel from real life. This is not somebody in the 1800s thinking what it looked like. This is Washington not wanting to take have his image made with, he said, I'm worried people are gonna use this image to make a profit. I don't want this done. And they had to convince him to actually sit down in his regalia for this image. This is on one of his Masonic aprons. That's the Bible he was sworn into at the Fredericksburg Lodge. It'd be amazing. 1754 is when, two years after that, he entered military service 
the French and Indian War. In, the Europe, in Europe, it was called the Seven Years War. Here's an interesting question. How many years did the Seven Years War last for? <laughs> Nine. <laughs> um, uh, it's, you've probably read articles in like Time and Newsweek or People or what have you about how, as a young British soldier, right, loyal to the crown, at Fort Necessity, he set the world on fire, right? He triggered what some people consider World, world War Zero or World War One, as they called it back then, right? And that he triggered it accidentally. Um, he was stationed in Winchester. Of course, it was you know not called Winchester back then in today's Trenger County, about 16 miles from the Cape. He had constructed Fort Loudon in Winchester. He actually drew that, that's the blueprint. It's pretty good, pretty talented. Um, 16 miles from the Cape. Caves make good Masonic lodges when you think about it, especially if you're out somewhere and you want to be really private, especially if it's a cave that you can't really see until you stumble upon it because it's in a flat territory have natural air conditioning, the, the temperature is constant. The, the air in this cave at least is clean, some caves not so much. It can have you know poisonous gases, but this one doesn't. The temperature is the same all year round, nice, stable, comfortable. And, and it's also a Masonic metaphor. In fact, Freemasons have been using caves, that's in Arizona, they've been using caves for a long, long time. Not just the Freemasons, Right? The Knights Templar, other organizations have used caves for a long time. This actually is the cave at Charlestown, George Washington Masonic Cave in the 1920s. Um, and these are some Freemasons going in to check it out. This is a, this photo is hanging in the um, city council hall in Charlestown in, in the uh, city building. It's not published, I just took a picture and walked in. Um, Military Masonic lodges were known to exist back then. There are no records, but we know that they had Masonic lodges associated with the military. Most of his, uh, Washington's confidants were Freemasons, and their letters going back and forth from Winchester to Fredericksburg talking about lodge elections and things like that. So Washington was still plugged in with Freemasonry even when he was out on the frontier. Just so happens that the cave farm was owned by George Fairfax, who was in charge of the Frederick County Militia, right? So this whole thought that this cave was used as a Masonic Lodge, military Masonic Lodge, during that war, a lot of this kind of lines up. I haven't found any evidence that doesn't line up, let's put it that way. We see a lot of communication between Washington and between uh, Fort Loudoun and people nearby the cave, a lot of commingling of resources between Bullskin, the Iron Forges, right next to the cave, and George Washington's military headquarters. It's all kind of like very fluid. This is the image as you're walking out of the cave. What's also interesting is that naturally the, the, the ceiling is angled. It's almost like some natural greater power, like angles are really important to Freemasons. Is, is that true? It's like, that's everything to them, right? Not everything, but that's like one of their main symbols. So it almost makes sense, like George Washington walks in here, George Fairfax walked in here, and they're like, well, it's almost like it was made for us as a Masonic cave. Interestingly, throughout the French and Indian War, this is actually a, uh, from a, um, a, I forget which department, but it's like from one of the federal departments where they're trying to show, you know, how Washington went from Alexandria, and now here to Winchester, and then on up here to Fort Duquesne and Fort Necessity. But the reality is throughout that war, Washington didn't just simply go from Alexandria to Winchester, the cave is over here, they actually went right by the cave. 
They oversimplify things in this textbook. In fact, for example, in the famous Braddock expedition, defeat really, uh, General Braddock was sent over by the Crown to try to deal with the French who were trying to invade Virginia. And George Washington volunteered as an aide. And they traveled through Vestal's Gap nearby where the, the vessel's bloomery is and passed by Charlestown, even camped out on land that, that uh, was owned by George Washington's younger brother. Washington, of course, surveyed it and helped him get it, but it was that land was actually not George Washington's, but it was Jack Washington. We'll come to him in a second. Um, and there's the cave. So just a couple miles away is where the whole military procession, 2,400 soldiers, dozens of pack horses, cannons, and other heavy artillery that year. And they had to cut through the wilderness and pay, not pay, but make a road so that they could support all this artillery to make it all the way up north to fight the French. And it took a long time. And one of the main camps was right here, very close, not down in Winchester over here, 16 miles away, but like a mile or two from the cave. So again, it all kind of lines up like, oh, it's possible. You know, I'm not convinced, but like it's kind of possible, right? George Washington retired first time. He went back, of course, and had a second military career, but he first retired from his first military duty in 1759. George took his bride, Martha Custis, widowed, two young kids, toddlers. He married her, went to live at Mount Vernon, which he had inherited after his brother died and his brother's wife also died. But I shouldn't say his brother's wife, his brother's wife's daughter, his niece, died as an infant. She was going to inherit, she died, so it went to George Washington. Um, and he kind of settled in to domestic life at Mount Vernon. He's like, I'm done with the frontier and roughing it. It's nice here. He was a very doting stepfather to the two young kids, brought them into the, into town to different fairs and, and bought them musical instruments and helped them with their studies and found tutors. He was like dad, right? We don't, when we look at Mount Rushmore, we don't think of George Washington dad, right? He became a dad, never had any kids of his own, but he considered them his children. And he began his fourth career, surveyor, land investor, soldier, fourth career, politician, right? So in the House of Burgesses in Williamsburg. In 1761, two years after he was married, George Washington wrote a very interesting letter it was a reply letter to this man named Andrew Barnaby, who was English, came to the American colonies in 17, uh, probably here, 1759 and 1760, and toured the American colonies and wrote what he saw for people back in England who would never get the chance to see America to kind of hear what it's like. And he stopped over at Mount Vernon twice while he and stayed with George Washington. And after he got back to England, he wrote this letter. And Andrew says, hey, George, and he starts off though, it's like a three-page letter. He says, George, tell me more about that well or natural curiosity you were telling me about out on the frontier. What's that all about? What makes that well water rise up and down? It's very fascinating. And George Washington writes a reply, we'll look at it in a second, and in his letter he pinpoints the location of the cave, the dimensions, and some unique features of the cave that convince us that he was in this cave multiple times. I found this letter, by the way, why didn't anybody find this letter before? It's called Technology, right? So I went on the Library of Congress website into their founders and typed in cave, bing, George Washington Cave, bing, this letter. Uh, 1761, it must have been his recollections from the 1750s, because he was 1759, he was married in, in Mount Vernon. 
wasn't coming out to the cave anymore. So he's recollecting the cave from the 1750s during the war, which is said to have been when he used the cave as Masonic Lodge. And here's what George Washington writes to Andrew. You must, in some measure, sir, have misunderstood my account of the cavern near Winchester. It's not a well, it's a cavern. Or I greatly aggravated the circumstances in giving a relation of it. True, it is that within 16 miles of Winchester, to the northeast hand of it, in a plain flat country. No way is contiguous to any mountain or constant running water. There stands a natural cave or well, which at times a person may go down into a depth of 100 or 150 yards, and at other times the water rises to the top and flows plentifully. But I never observed any regular flux or reflux, or that this happened at any fixed periods. On the contrary, I always concluded and have been so informed that the dry and wet seasons was the sole and only occasion of these changes. However, as it lies within two miles of my, of my plantation in Frederick, I will, when next time I go up there, make a more minute inquiry of the most intelligent people in the neighborhood and give you a further account thereof in my next letter. And this journey I propose to undertake as soon as my health will permit, which at present is in a very declining way. Um, <clears throat> The subsequent letter from George was lost. Can't find it. They communicated. They were pen pals for a few more times, but we, there's nothing else in the letters that talks about the cave. And some of the letters have been lost. Sadly. Now, <clears throat> if you just do the simple math and you say, okay, that's where his fort was in Winchester, and you draw a line 16 miles to the northeast, it, yeah, the cave is 16 miles away. And if you measure where his property was, and it would have to be within, and he says in that direction, it would have to be within two miles. So it would have to be on this line. Where they intersect is right where the cave is. So it's definitely the cave. It's not like we're talking about some different cave here. <laughs> I am no geologist either. But this is what's called karst topography. It's kind of like a sponge or Swiss cheese where water basically erodes, makes passageways and caves, and whenever it rains, the water goes down into this very porous limestone, Swiss cheese. Okay. And that's that passageway. I've been back to the cave, I guess, maybe four, four more times or five, I don't recall. Um, I've been there when the water is all the way up to the ceiling, and I've been in there where it's bone dry. A buddy of mine who went into the cave with me, who's gone into all the caves in uh, this part of the country, his name is, he goes by the name Aqua Chigger. He's a YouTube guy. Anybody know that name? Bone Weenan. Bone Weenan, right? He said, I've been all the caves around here. There's only one I know that just fills up with water and goes down. He had been in it in like the 1980s. We went in together, did a little video for his YouTube channel. Um, so even the description, the location, the size, the flat land outside, it's definitely the cave. Interestingly, in 1773, about two years before things really heat up with the British, two of George Washington's full brothers, that Samuel Washington, he also purchased land and moved out to Charlestown. Well, a mile outside of today's Charleston. There was no Charlestown then. His home is the last, it's called Harewood. It's the last Washington mansion that's still occupied by Walter, Walter of Washington. Okay. So Samuel was one of the purchasers. That's Jack, John Augustine Washington, another brother. George called him dad. This is George Washington's favorite brother. This is George Washington's personal land agent. This is who would go out west. His name is William Crawford. He was a soldier as well. These and other men who were very close competence of George Washington purchased the cave. So like a couple of decades after it's said to have been used as a Masonic Lodge. It's almost like they were trying to preserve it or something. I don't think, it, there was no town yet. I mean, caves sometimes are used for storage, like ammunition or food. This cave fills up with water. Right? Probably not a storage place. And there was no town. There were no taverns that you had. No, it wasn't that. It wasn't to keep meat cool or anything like that. 
Um, purchase price was nine dollars. So one and eight acres. Each man put in a dollar, and they each got one eighth of an acre. Nine men. It was also right adjacent to the Norborn Parish Glebe. That's the farm that supported the church that George Washington went to and now crumbled, right? Back then, Freemasonry was considered the handmaid to the church. Nowadays, there's like a uh, separation of church and lodge almost, right? You're not even supposed to talk about your religion. Back then, it was like a Venn diagram. Freemasonry, Christianity, overlapped. And the men who founded churches also founded the Glebes and, and the Masonic Lodges. These two properties are right next to each other, and the same people owned the Glebe right next to it. I think they're connected historically. George Washington was not one of the men listed on the document, on the deed, right? But in one of his letters to Samuel Washington, <laughs> He said, our lands are over the mountains. They like they kind of like commingled the land. It's like, yeah, in spirit, George Washington was on the Masonic cave, perhaps. These same men went on to become significant instigators in the American Rebellion. I don't want to get into conspiracy theories. <laughs> There's been a debate for hundreds of years about whether or not Freemasonry, whether the American Revolutionary was like a War was a Masonic plot to overthrow the government. Some people still think that that's the case. And others think that Freemasonry had nothing to do with that. Truth probably lies somewhere in the middle. How are we doing for time? Oh, got 20 minutes. I better speed up. Or we won't get done. Um, so, 1775, shot heard around the world, Lexington alarm letter was sent out and spread through the committees of safety. Oftentimes, these were filled with Freemasons. On May 10th, able-bodied men around the cave started drilling in a lot in what's now Shepherdstown. June 14th, Continental Congress called for 10 companies of expert riflemen raised from the counties of Virginia. Pennsylvania, Maryland, Chambersburg is where the guy who led um, that contingency. I'd love to do one of these lectures in Chambersburg if anybody, I don't even know if they have a library there. I have more to say about Chambersburg than Hager's now. Sorry. Um, Washington's put in charge as general for the defense of American liberty, and he traveled from Philadelphia up to Boston at the siege of Boston. It's a crucial military, the harbor was, objective. What, what he found is the troops were poorly organized. So he called up his buddies back to the cave. So the Beeline March to Cambridge, and remember this is 1775, about 1776, right? Two Virginia companies, all volunteers, leaders personally chosen by GW. One was Daniel Morgan, who made a tremendous career in the Revolutionary War. He led the contingency from Winchester, and another man named Hugh Stevenson, uh, he was the head of the captain of the um, uh, the group of men who came from near the cave, and he was one of the cave co-owners, like many of them. He was Scottish, and they dressed like Western frontiersmen, and they had these long rifles that had grooves inside. They could far outshoot him with greater accuracy than muskets the British had, and Washington knew that. And they had also served with Washington during the French and Indian War. So they were, had a lot of war experience, and they supported their families by hunting out on the frontier. These were very hardy men. They had tomahawks and scal scalping knives. And they raced to be by the general side. These two rifle companies, one by Daniel Morgan, the other by Hugh Stevenson. Yeah. They went 600 miles in 25 hot days. They didn't go in, you know, through normal paths. They went in a straight line, hence the name Beeline Mars to Cambridge. In this picture, we see them arriving, and General Washington is seated on his horse. But in a journal from one of these men who marched up Virginia, that's not how it went down. George Washington hopped off his horse. He was usually a very stoic person. He hopped off his horse, horse ran over to the Virginian soldiers, shook every one of their hands and hugged them and had tears flowing down his face. 
That's how it went down. We have several types of soldiers, African American soldier, northern part of American soldier is Virginia, is a Frenchman. 1776, next year Stevenson was promoted to colonel, but he died soon thereafter. He went back towards the cave, he lived right next door to the cave, um, and tried to raise more troops. He'd been given money to do so, but he died in his bed long after its run. No one ever made a statue for him, there are no paintings, there's nothing, not a plaque for him, nothing. Can't find his grave, nothing. It took a while, but in 1988, the United States Army recognized the rally point near Shepherdstown as the birthplace of the United States Army by these two Freemasons, one from Winchester, one who was a cave owner, lived right next to it. During the tail end of the American Revolutionary War, this guy, his name is General John Bull, top ranking Freemason from Philadelphia. He served with GW in the French and Indian War. He was actually the master at Valley Forge. And he was the one who nominated George Washington to be the General Grand Master of the United States. However, that never came to be. There was no national lodge. Every state has its own Grand Lodge. But he proposed that. He actually purchased, that's the cave, that's the cave farm. He purchased, after Stevenson died, Colonel Stevenson died, he purchased and went to live during the war at Stevenson's home, his land. Right? And he worked behind the scenes, going back and forth between Charlestown and Philadelphia, between and between the Treasury and Philadelphia and George Washington. One letter, John Hancock says to George Washington, hey, General Bull is bringing $2,500 in cash for your army. It's not as much as it sounds. But he was also the cave's overseer during the Revolutionary War, the George Washington Masonic. We know that because these two people, James and Sarah Norris, read the cave. She wrote in a journal. She kept a diary. And every summer they would go out to the cave and live in a house they assemble a temporary house to live in, but they would also go into the cave. And some of her passages from her journal, Mr. N, her husband, to take dimensions at E cave. She always capitalized it, right? Poor cave. So like he's, why would you measure a cave? Cleaned out the cave? Why would a woman go in and clean out a cave? Ladies and gentlemen from General Bowles in the morning to see the cave and another set of them in the evening. It's like they're tourists who are coming to the cave to see something, maybe the signature of George Washington, I don't know. But we see that General Adam Stephen, Daniel Morgan, Horatio Gates, they all stopped by the cave in her journal. So did Charles and Samuel Washington, the Chevalier de Boucher, and other French gentlemen, perhaps Lafayette. No proof that he went there during the Revolutionary War, but some other French gentlemen stopped by. <clears throat> James, was appointed by the Congress to ensure war funds. I found some documentation that he was the person who made sure money got to the v line marchers. Their son, Joseph, was a Freemason in Philadelphia who became the first clerk of the war board. They were the people who were designing the war plans. And he also became the register of the treasury of the United States for 40 years. He managed the U.S.'s money throughout the war, the Revolutionary War, and the first six presidential administrations. Pretty important guy. Oh, good. Yeah, he was married to General Bull's daughter. It's a lot of circumstantial coincidental stuff, right? <clears throat> After the war, the cave farm was inherited by Ferdinando Fairfax, who was a nephew of George Fairfax. George Washington was his godfather and benefactor, and he went to live on part of what was called the cave farm, the, the Shannon Hill Park. It was all one big property. He was a member of a lodge. He was involved with George Washington's funeral rites in 1799. His brother-in-law, John Blair Jr., was the first Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of Virginia. They offered it to George Washington, but George Washington was kind of busy that year, mm -hmm. right? Ferdinand O'Fair, so his brother-in-law was the first Grand Master of the Grand Lodge, and he lived there. 1790, he had a very early plan to liberate African Americans within the United States. 
published in the American Museum, which was a journal funded by Lafayette, the Marquis. Now, let's not give him too much credit. This guy, Fernando, owned more slaves and land around the Cape than anybody at that time. He was the richest man around. But he squandered it. It was very poor investments and lost most of it. So what's the connection with Hagerstown? That's why it came out here. Kind of really great, right? Um, ballroom dancing. You're like, what? Huh? How did we get there? Right? This this George dancing at the Victory Ball of 1781 shortly after um, the end of the fighting of the Revolutionary. It didn't formally end until several years later. George Washington called dancing the gentler conflict. This is in Fredericksburg. At one of the buildings that was used for Masonic purposes as well, called the Tavern of the Rising Sun. And then when George Washington was president, he first moved to New York City and then to Philadelphia. And he set many presidents. Of course you do. You're the first president. You're going to set lots of presidents, including a cabinet of advisors. But he also had a very active social life. He was the first first family, right? And they went to plays and circuses, and of course, dancing. This is in Philadelphia. That is the Weller's Hotel, established in 1791. That's the circus. Right there is the courthouse. Right? That's the presidential mansion that George Washington lived in. Right? Eh, doesn't look as nice as the White House, right? He had never got that privilege. He only did the Masonic, you know, ceremonies for the dedication you know, when they started the, the groundbreaking for the White House and the Capitol building. They weren't up yet before he died. So he lived there when he was president. And the dance master here inside this hotel was James Robert, Robert A. Frenchman. And he, this is where all the, the really rich people went to learn dance. But George Washington was not one of the really rich people. He was the president. So he just had Robert A. come on over to the presidential mansion and teach his grandkids dancing there. It's the French minuet to be precise. You see the dance steps. It's very in vogue back then. So this Robardet, James Robardet, left a trail of newspaper ads. He led a very nomadic lifestyle. He called himself in one ad an instructor of the polite accomplishment of dancing after the most approved method. Started in upstate New York, Connecticut, back in New York. Philadelphia at the hotel, and then he taught Nellie and Wash how to dance, and then he was in Annapolis and Eastern Pennsylvania, Eastern Pennsylvania, Baltimore, Philadelphia, he got married, went back to Baltimore, lived on Fish Market Street, according to the telephone book. We know he was a Freemason because you can't really do this nowadays. You can't use Freemasonry for your business activities. You're not supposed to be that overt, at least. So this is from the uh, Grand Lodge of Free and Accepted Masons in the state of New York, whose first Grand Master was Robert Livingston, the same guy who swore George Washington uh, in as first president in the inauguration. And they talk about Brother James Robert Robardet saying, hey, let people know I'm a teacher of the, of the art of dancing. Can you help me get some business? And the Lodge, the Grand Lodge sort of like just punted it. George Washington didn't. He wrote a letter um, to his sister, Betty, and the wife of one of his uh, best friends from Philadelphia when he was president. He says how James Robert is a dancer up here to teach my grandkids how to dance, and he wants to come to Virginia. Um, maybe you can help him like line up some business down there. This is one of his ads. He talks about when he was in Annapolis, that's this, the state house, that he had a dancing school in the assembly room. A unique connections or a letter from George Washington. George Washington did not write those kind of letters very often. He was very careful. Uh, it's the same room where George Washington has a statue where he surrendered his commission as the general. Um, in 1792, all right, that was in Annapolis. And interestingly, about 1809, Robardet's name shows up on the maps right where the cave is. Right? Charlestown, Ebbets Run, that's kind of the big blue. It's not a very accurate map. It's where Fernando Fairfax lived, and Thomas Hammond, that's who lived in Happy Retreat, 
um, after Charles Washington died, right? And I think that he probably lived, uh, lived there or came there before 1809. You don't get your name on the map as one of the most influential people the very moment you, you move there. It's true that there is a deed showing that he purchased part of the cave farm from Ferdinand of Fairfax, and it mentions in the deed that Robardet's kitchen chimney, it sounds like Robardet was already living there, plus three years earlier, Robardet was a witness to an addendum to Ferdinand of Fairfax's last will and testament. So this is somebody who not only bought land from Fernando, but was somebody who would be trusted to witness his will. And perhaps be a caretaker of the cave, maybe? Like, why would a dance master move out to the countryside next to a cave outside of town? It's kind of an odd place. And here's 1820, right? That first map was 1809. 1820, still, only person living, at least on this map, right where the cave is. Cave is on this map, Google Maps, right after the bifurcation of Evans Run, well, the unification of Evans uh, Run, that's where the cave is. Again, not the most accurate map. Thomas Hammond, still living up here in Happy Retreat, two miles south, you can see the loop of the river, loop of the river. Fairfax living over here. Ferdinand over here. Google, or, uh, Google images again. So this is the cave right here. Evans Run, you can't see it. It goes behind the trees. It's a very small little stream. This is Old Cave Road, came in much later. And then there's this thing called Old, uh, called Cave Quarters, very old building. These are all modern homes that surround it. And there's an association between cave quarters and cave farm and the cave, obviously. This is the cave quarters. Nobody really knows who built it or when. If you look at the design, it looks like 1700s, 18th century, not 1800s. Somebody still lives in it, right? And the historians and library in Charles Sumner have no clue. I think maybe it was George Fairfax who first got this land. Don't know exactly who built it or when. Robard A, here are a couple of his ads from the farmer's repositories of Charlestown newspaper back then. And um, he even he says that, let's see here, in his house, right? So he was having the dance lessons in his house, right? And he's also selling a selection of the best promoters or Italian violins, who's kind of a hustler too, right? <laughs> Um, so he's teaching dance lessons in 1810 in Jefferson County, and here he's saying that he wants to have some dance lessons in Shepherdstown as well, as soon as he can get enough scholars. And he also ran a bunch of string of ads here in Hagerstown. Didn't live here, but he sure liked to place adverts in the taverns. Uh, I don't know much of the history, you know, but Levi Price Tavern is one. Bunch of them. Here's uh, 1815, Maryland Herald. The subscriber tenders his respects to his friends in Hagerstown and its vicinity, informs him that he has opened his dancing school at Mr. Pett's Tavern. He must have been commuting up from Charlestown. Hours of tuition for ladies who attend until noon, men gentlemen that had candlelight. And then he also taught younger men, uh, suitable for the uh, young gentlemen who attend the academy. I don't even know what academy that would have been back then. I'm sure some of you know, didn't research that. He also taught fencing. 1814 is when Washington, D.C. was burned by British in the War of 1812. This may not have been just a sport. This may have been actually for a reason. In fact, he says, uh, uh, we'll demonstrate the necessary attack and the defense, which is highly necessary at this time. I don't know much about Robardet's history. I don't know how old he was, where he was born in France, when he came here. I can't find him. Research in France. He was older than his bride, clearly. Maybe he fought in the Revolutionary War. I don't know. I can't find him. Interestingly, Robardet and Fernando Fairfax both died in 1820. We know that because Robardet's name is in an obituary in the 1820 census. His wife is head of the household. Clearly, they had no children. 
Four years later, the K farm portion that they bought was released, and his wife was the only stated heir. heir. Um, and she eventually moved north, uh, moved back north, and died decades later around the age of 96, never remarried. Fernando Fairfax also died that year. His obituary in the Washington, D.C. paper says, a polite and accomplished gentleman possessing every kind of knowledge except that of worldly. He was sober, frugal, and industrious. He had more money escaped him than any other man. <laughs> <laughs> in his will, the cave farm was supposed to go to the son of George Washington's pastor back in Alexandria. That never happened because he had already died. And in the codicil, that one that was signed by Robardet in 1806, the original will was 1799, Robert, uh, Ferdinando Fairfax bequeathed $300 to Charlestown's Freemasons to build a lodge when such will be instituted. So remember, this is like, he's associated with the leading Freemasons in Virginia, and he's living right next to the Masonic cave and has all this history. And here he is thinking about building an actual lodge, an above-ground lodge, when it's the time. Here's one of, one of my hypotheses. So, 1754, the cave myth. 1760, we know Freemasonry was active in Winchester. 1768 is when Winchester's, that's their emblem. Uh, the Huron Lodge was formally established. 1799, Front Royal had a lodge. 1811, Shepherdstown. 1818, Harper's Ferry. This is Harper's Ferry's Lodge right there. Uh, 1819, Middleway, a very small hamlet. It used to be called Smithfield. It's about a 15 mile, 15 minute drive west of Charlestown in Jefferson County. They had their home Masonic Lodge in 1819, tiny little community. 1827, you guys got your first lodge here in Hagerstown. It wasn't until 1839 that Charlestown finally had an above ground lodge. And this is the town that had the richest, most influential Washingtons and Freemasons in it. Like, where were they meeting? Catch my drift? Probably inside the, the Masonic Cave still, would be my guess. I don't have time to go much further. Um, I've got copies of my book here if you're interested in reading more. I wanted to hit a few more highlights before, I, before we uh, get out of here, just to kind of bring up a few of the other topics that might convince you like, whoa, wait a minute, well, let me take a closer look at this. George Washington, Edmund Pendleton, and Patrick Henry heading to the First Continental Congress. Um, and the Pendleton family, very closely associated with the cave and the land around the cave. In fact, they intermarried with the Kennedys who came to live at the cave farm. Um, again, there's the cave, and eventually the Kennedys built that big Shenandoah Springs spa where all the first presidents of the United States, it was kind of their retreat, Camp David, until it burned the ground. Um, and it turns out that the Kennedys, the Kennedy that was running in the early 1800s, it was running the cave farm and the cave, was a nephew of the same Kennedy who owned the presidential mansion back in Philadelphia. And in their family records, they even talk about how this Andrew Kennedy had to go up to Philadelphia in the early 1800s and sell the presidential mansion, the building that was used as such. No longer stands, but it has a very good tenant nowadays, one that's not going anywhere anytime soon. It's called the Liberty Bell. Right? So the Kennedys owned the K Farm, where the Statue of Liberty is, presidential mansion where Robardet used to be the dance teacher before he came to live in the cave. This is that spa across the river. A little bit later in the 1800s, the Seldens came. Remember Farmer Selden? Talked about him during the Civil War, right? He was not just some ordinary farmer living on the cave farm, right? The Kennedys still had this property up here. This is the Seldens and the cave was there. Farmer Seldon was the son of Wilson Carey Seldon, who lived in Loudoun County across the river in Exeter, who was one of George Washington's closest buddies. They shared the same land agent. And so there was a lot of commingling after the Revolutionary War between Washington's crops 
at Bolskin and his crops in Loudoun County. And it was his son that was farming the K farm. It's never brought up when, so when, when uh, in 1864, when they came out and asked for farmer Selden, say, can we take a look at your K, George Washington came. Nobody even mentioned, oh, by the way, um, he's my dad, and his twin sister is married to another, well, these are Freemasons, of course, Dr. James McClurg, another very early Virginia patriot. And by the way, Carrie, that's a whole other story right there, right? George Fairfax's wife, Sally Fairfax, who is George Washington's maybe first romance or something more than that. It's been debated for a long time, right? So these are the same people, right? Descendant of the Carries, son living at the cave farm. Now here, this is um, a sketch of John Selden's cave farm done by an illustrator named Port Cram. Does that ring the bell? Well, he was also related to the Kennedys. He wrote Swallow Barn. It's probably, it's like the Gone with the Wind, the 1800s, and he illustrated it. And that's because um, he was involved with the Kennedys as well, and like, which were later involved with the Seldons. What I uncovered was a stash of letters at Mount Vernon so John Augustine, or Augustine Washington III, the last owner of Mount Vernon, this is George Washington's tomb or crypt or esophagus, and Martha's right next to him. It's a big obelisk right in front, honoring John Augustine Washington III, Lieutenant Colonel of the Confederate States of America, died early on in the Civil War, and his wife, Eleanor Love Selden, buried in Charlestown, writing letters. She, his wife, was staying at the key farm, writing letters back to Mount Vernon to her husband. Those back of them. People at Mount Vernon never even heard of the key farm before. They do now. Some of them. Right? <clears throat> Their son, well, eldest son, Freemason. Interestingly, even into the 1920s, the Seldens, I mean, this is her tombstone. She makes it clear. She was born at the cave, in quote, right? It's not direct evidence. That's a heck of a lot of circumstantial evidence. This, this cave had a huge significance to George Washington and the people that he was closest connected to and their descendants. The Marquis de Lafayette, George Washington's youngest general, French men who pretty much helped us win our war by going over to France and with Benjamin Franklin getting the King of France to join in with the American rebels, right? After the war, he gave George Washington this Masonic apron. Went missing for a while, but said to be the, the apron that Washington wore when he laid the cornerstone for the Capitol. This is actually a painting inside the Capitol, the U.S. Capitol building. And it had been lost for a long time. <clears throat> Nobody could figure out where did this apron grow, go except for some Freemasons living near the cave. It's all in my book. Turns out that after George Washington died, this man, Thomas Hammond, who lived at Happy Retreat because he was married to this woman, who is Charles Washington's daughter, Mildred. After he, he got this apron. It's all in the documents of Mount Vernon and brought it out to Charlestown. And it was his son, whose name was George Washington Hammond, who also later inherited Happy Retreat, and later sold it. He was the one who gave this apron to the Freemasons in Jefferson County, where it resides today, at the lodge in Shepherdstown, right? And this wasn't all pieced out, pieced together until like 10 years ago. That's pretty much it, folks. Any questions? <clears throat>